Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have here each morning. And as we look at the last study this week, weekday, this morning, we are thankful for all of your blessings and um, the trials that we face. We know, Lord, that you have foreseen them all and that you have a purpose and a plan. Help us to trust in your purposes and your providence. As we open your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit to instruct us, to give us insight into the things that we are studying. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, without you, there's only darkness before us. And so we ask that this light uh, can shine on our path and that you can give us the faith to walk each step of the way. Bless each person. May your angels watch over them and be with us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. Now, we haven't read the Spirit of Prophecy comments addressing the sons of Eli. Now, of course, there's a lot here. And um, yesterday we started drawing uh, these on a line. And so we're going to look into these things and see what things we can find. Now, what do we see? Um, well, in 1 Samuel 2, verse 17, what is it we see there? Therefore, wherefore the, young, the sin of the young men was very great for the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. What is it that we see there? That because of what was going on with Ophni and Phinehas, that the people began to turn away from that, that they were instructed was to be done on an annual basis yeah okay and and we see uh, a symbol there 217 that's right. uh, that's a symbol of july 21st which is midnight in millerite history it's also ezekiel's first vision is july 21st uh, 592 bc and also the fifth day of the fourth month uh, both of them are on the biblical calendar <clears throat> But we're going to read, read these statements here and see what things apply and what we can gain from this. So as they drew near to the city, they met some young maidens who had come out to draw water and inquired of them for the seer. In reply, they were told that a religious service was about to take place, that the prophet had already arrived. There was to be an offering upon the high place and after that a sacrificial feast. A great change had taken place under Samuel's administration. When the call of God first came to him, the services of the sanctuary were held in contempt. Men abhorred the offering of the Lord, but the worship of God was now maintained throughout the land, and the people manifested an interest in religious services. There being no ministration in the tabernacle, sacrifices were for the time offered elsewhere, and the cities of the priests and Levites, where the people res resorted for instruction, were chosen for this purpose. The highest points in these cities were usually selected as the place of sacrifice and hence were called high, the high places. So this is in Patriarchs and Prophets. So so what is what does Ellen White say says is happening here? How would we understand this? Like we're just reading this one paragraph, obviously, without a whole context. So what what's happening? So what's happening with the sanctuary? In, Look, in at this point, since this is looking at the time when Samuel is now prophet, priest, and judge, that there had been a revival. Okay. But this they're not going to be um, having service, service, services at the sanctuary, right? They're going to be having them in, in various places. Now, does that seem according to God's plan? Well, after the, after the situation had been set aside with Shiloh, and that's after, of course, the, the Ark had been taken by the Philistines. The Ark was not, no longer at Shiloh. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to figure out is exactly when this is. So this is when there is no uh, Ark in the sanctuary. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, it doesn't give us that context. I mean, we're just reading this par paragraph out of context. Now, where is this that this is happening? So obviously we, we see 1 Samuel 2.17, but what is the reference of the verse if we could look at 
this? The passage of Spirit of Prophecy? No, the what she's referring to in the Bible. Okay. So it's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 3 to 7 that you're going to have this whole story. So first you're going to have, because Eli's going to die when the ark is taken. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just... So this is in the chapter, the first king of Israel. Right. The chapter before that is the chapter, the school of the prophets. So you have these uh, uh, chapters in, uh, you got Eli and his sons is chapter 56. Then the ark taken by the Philistines is chapter 57. Then the school of the prophets, chapter 58. Then the first king of Israel is chapter 59. It's going to be in that chapter that we have this. So, so um, in page 604, it says, so because Samuel's going to appoint his sons to office, right? But they, it was the full assent of the nation that Samuel had appointed his sons to office, but they did not prove themselves worthy of their father's choice. And the Lord had, through Moses, given special directions to his people that the rulers of Israel should judge righteously. Um, deal justly with the widow and the fatherless and receive no bribes. So, I mean, we're going to look into these verses later, but um, just in in a general sense, we can see here, this is going to be after this, the school of the prophets are set up that you're going to have then uh, this, for this, this uh, statement here in the spirit of prophecy uh, in 609. Right. So there is no ark. So what does this mean then that there is, like, how would we parallel this with our history? Because we know God's purpose was to have the Seventh-day Adventist church as his His instrument to reach the gospel, to, to send the gospel to the world. The church has failed in that regard at this point. That we believe that one day they will be restored as not necessarily the organizational structure, but as far as Seventh-day Adventists is, Adventism is concerned, there is going to be a true revival, right? And people will join the church, so to speak, as as many people leave. <clears throat> so does this is this appropriate for what's been happening at the present time? I guess is the question. Has has the ark been taken? At the present time, yes. Okay. Now that's that's a pretty difficult thing to say. No. You know, well, I mean, for most Seventh Day Adventists, you didn't let me finish my sentence. You know, they're going to look at, you know, the Seventh Day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy, which we also believe. But we can see in past histories that there are times in which the church is failing in its mission and God has other means in which he's going to work and operate. And and so for us to to claim, well, this is the time that Ellen White has talked about and the Bible has illustrated, we would have to have really strong evidence to show that. So how would we show that the ark has been taken in our time? Because the church didn't take heed of what Lewis said, we were saying they didn't take heed of what Jeff was saying, and whoever else, you know, has been trying to get them to get their butts in gear, so to speak. Uh, and of course, it goes back further. Yeah. So, I mean, we we look you know, at it goes 19- back to the 1844, really 1856, I don't know. Yeah. 1888. Yeah, so, I mean, right. Yeah. So we could go back to to New <laughs> But we have a certain point in which we can take these way marks, 1989 and 9-11, and show that the church has failed in the mission of recognizing these prophetic way marks. That is, Millerite history is being repeated, and the church is unaware of it. Right. But to demonstrate to other people that that is the time that we are living in, how would we do that? Because, would, you know, it's, again, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, Dwight. Okay, wouldn't it? I mean, in recognition of the fact that the two tables of Habakkuk have been set aside, mm-hmm. that they are not 
that were not in any manner in the corporate church choosing to study or accept the messages that they've given. Isn't that the same thing as the ark no longer being in Shiloh? I mean, at, at this point, what we're talking about from this particular paragraph, this is just before Saul is anointed as king. Yeah. Now, we know that the ark did not have a tabernacle in which it was to be placed. And this is before the temple was was built because it wasn't built under Saul or David. Okay, you, you, you're you saying the tabernacle is not in, in existence? Well, the tabernacle had basically, had basically that aside, hadn't it? Hey, Dwight, go again. Okay. Hadn't the the worship in Shiloh been set aside after the death of Eli and after the, the ark had been taken? Yeah, but wouldn't they still have the tabernacle? Or what happened to the tent itself? That's what I'm asking if you... Because you seem to be saying that there is no tabernacle. Once the ark was taken, they didn't take the tabernacle. They took the ark, but... They didn't revere the tabernacle as they had. Mm -hmm. So it may not even be being set up right. after the ark was gone, is what you're trying to say. Right. And and obviously it would be fairly old, not that God couldn't preserve it. But when they build the temple... Uh, there is no tabernacle at that time. Is that sort of what we, there is no direct statement that I know about that. I was going to say that it, it, you, I would think it would be the lines. You could show it through the lines. Oh, okay. You're saying as far as showing other people. That's right. Show yeah. it through the lines. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely the, the lines are part of it, but, but I'm thinking more, how do we establish those lines? How do we, demonstrate this parallel and it would be the rejection of habakkuk's two tables right that's what you're saying dwight right that's what we would have to show adventists that if we're gonna if we're gonna address this point that um the ark being taken the glory has departed I ichabod and with the death of eli if we're gonna mark the death of eli uh wouldn't we mark 9 11 all right Right. Now, we talked in the past, you know, Jeff had about 1989, you know, that the, the leadership is passed by. Right. And that is light is going to come to the common people. Right. So in, prior to 1989, we have ministers in, in the church who are presenting the truths of Scripture prior to 1989, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. It's it's not primarily coming from lay people. There is ministers who have been presenting truths. But after 1989, it's going to go to Jeff Pippinger, right? God is going to give him the light in regard to the repeat of Millerite history. And it's not like there aren't other people who are recognizing what's happening, right? I mean, I, did, I didn't understand the time of the end in 1989, but I did understand the fall of the Soviet Union and its prophetic significance in regard to Daniel 11, verse 40, B, right? So I understood that, just not thinking, okay, well, that's also the time in the end and no right history is being repeated. But so God is, is preparing people to receive this message. Now, when 9-11 happens, it is more than just that God has passed by the leadership as far as light. He's passed by the leadership of the church as far as as what? What is it that that happens? Is it a close of probation for the leadership? Is that how, how we would characterize it? That is, what's being tested in the first angel's message in Millerite history is Protestants, and they're going to have their door closed on April 19, 1844. And then we parallel that with 9-11. So that's the arrival of the second angel. And the leadership has closed the door of their probation. They had opportunity during that time to receive light. But when 9-11 occurs, and it's again not recognized because they haven't heeded the light, 
that the door closes for the leadership, not for individual people. We're not talking about individuals. We're just talking about the leadership as a symbol. And so we would have to say, is that when the glory departs? Is that when the ark is taken captive? And, and I would think that there's lots of different ways in which we could show that through the various lines. A- any thoughts on that? I think there's a bit to develop there. Yeah, there's definitely lots to develop. But we already have Mark 9-11 in, in that significance, that there's probation is closed for the leadership. And so, so 9-11 becomes the first day of the first month, and then we have Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, uh, which in that line that we have that bigger line, I guess, of the, the repeat of Millerite history, we're still not to midnight yet. We're still in the tearing time, but we are moving towards midnight um, very quickly, right? And we know between midnight and the midnight cry, that's going to be <clears throat> the point in which, um, you know, the message is going to to expand. It's going to swell to the midnight cry. So there's going to be a message given at midnight. So midnight has not happened in that particular line, right? Okay, Okay, let's read a bit more here. Eli was priest and judge in Israel. He held the highest and most responsible positions among the people. And as as a man divinely chosen for the sacred duties of the priesthood and set over the land in the highest judicial authority, he was looked looked up to as an example, and he wielded a great influence over the tribes of Israel. But although he had been appointed the go- to govern the people, he did not rule his own household. Eli was an indulgent father, loving peace and ease, and he did not exercise his authority to correct the evil habits and passions of his children. Rather than contend with them or punish them, he would submit to their will and give them their own way. Instead of regarding the education of his sons is one of the most important of his responsibilities. He treated the matter as of little consequence. The priest and judge of Israel had not been left in darkness as to the duty of restraining and governing the children that God had given in his care. But Eli shrank from this duty because it involved crossing the will of his sons and would make it necessary to punish and deny them. Without weighing the terrible consequences that would follow his course, he indulged his children in whatever they desired, and neglected the work of fitting them for the service of God and the duties of life. God said of Abraham, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, Genesis 18, 19. But Eli allowed his children to control him. The father became subject to the children. The curse of transgression was apparent in the corruption and evil that marked the course of his sons. They had no proper appreciation of the character of God, or the sacredness of his law. His service was to them a common thing. From childhood, they had been accustomed to the sanctuary and its service. But instead of becoming more reverent, they had lost all sense of its holiness and significance. The father had not corrected them or corrected their want of reverence for his authority and had not checked their disrespect for the solemn services of the sanctuary. And when they reached manhood, they were full of the deadly fruits of skepticism and rebellion. The wholly unfit for the office, they were placed as priests in the sanctuary to minister before God. The Lord had given the most specific directions in regard to offering sacrifices, but these wicked men carried their disregard of authority into the service of God and did not give attention to the law of the offerings, which were to be made in a most solemn manner. The sacrifices pointing forward to the death of Christ were designed to preserve uh, the hearts of the people of hearts of the people, faith in the Redeemer to come. Hence, it was of the greatest importance that the Lord's directions concerning them should be strictly heeded. The peace offerings were especially an expression of thanksgiving to God. In these offerings, the fat alone was to be burnt upon the altar. A certain specified portion was reserved for the priests. The greater part was returned to the offerer to be eaten by him and his friends in a sacrificial feast. Thus, all hearts hearts were to be directed in gratitude and faith to this great sacrifice that was to take away the sin of the world. So when we looked at this offering, it is a a peace offering, right? So what would happen is that his sons would take uh, more of of the offering than they were supposed to, the parts that they wanted, 
So how how would we parallel this in our history? Now, so we're we're taking a broader look at this at the moment. We're we're we're, we're stepping back, zooming out a little bit, just dealing with the church itself. Well, first off, when the systems of offerings and sacrifices were set up, there was quite a bit that was to be done for the widow, for the fatherless, for many others. Okay. Right now, the offerings and sacrifices, quote unquote, are being collected and being sent into the conferences and from there to the general conference. And this is more going for retirement funds, health funds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for those that work for the general conference. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously corruption has happened within the church and how the offerings are to be dealt with. Right. Right. Now we, we also have, when I was in British Columbia talking to the pastor there um, at Williams Lake, you know, he was, well, it wasn't him. Uh, it was somebody else. Yeah. Now I remember it wasn't him, but it's somebody else talking about, well, we need, still need to give our tithe to the church because, you know, the widow who gave her two mites, which was all she had, um, you know, she was, you know, her, she was commended upon in doing that. And yet it was a corrupt system. And so they use that as an example of why we still must always support the church, no matter how corrupt it is. So how would we answer that objection? Can we use this history? Yes. Okay. Right. So obviously it makes sense to commend the woman in giving her two mites because She's she's giving out out of out of her heart. So there's nothing wrong with that. God's not going to condemn somebody who who is giving out of their heart all that all all they're living, right? But that doesn't mean that that everyone should give everything to a corrupt system if that's if God is calling them to do something else. And so we can see here at this time, I mean, we, we should be able to see the parallel to that time and our time. And, and Ellen White writes of this, right? And of course, here she's hinting at it without direct, you know, direct, um, you know, statements. But um, she understands, I believe that, and well, we can show other places where she did redirect tithe um, differently than the church had wanted, specifically to the work in the South that the church did not want to do. And people would send their tithe to her and she would redirect that tithe to other work. So, I mean, it is a big issue in the church. Back in the 90s when they were dealing with um, Heartland Institute and um, Steps to Life and uh, uh, Hope International. And um, light bearers. Well, light bearers did not... Um, did, they didn't accept tithe. They they didn't. Uh, they weren't part of the rebuke. So there was this uh, booklet and then a book okay. uh, called Issues. And um, the the concern that the church had really was just the tithe money was being funneled away from the church through these other institutions. So so light bears actually stood with the church, which was uh, to some degree, I believe, their downfall. But that's just my view, because that, that meant compromise. But yet the reality was that, you know, conservatives give a lot more to God's work than liberals do, you know. So the fact that money is being directed um, away from the church, it would be directed anyway, because those conservatives, whether the church wants them to or not, is going to put that money where they see that it's, it's going to be used by God. But so the church really has not figured out that what they really need to do is to follow God and then they will be supported. But so that's an issue for the church. I, you know, bring it into the Lord's storehouse. And they believe that that has to be the Seventh day Adventist church, which, which I have a hard time with in, in, I mean, I gave tithe for years and years and years, uh, a lot more than I should have paid, but you know, I, I, I understood that, uh, 
you know, that, uh, you know, we need to pay our tithes, but we maybe need to redirect it. And I'm not telling people what to do, but I'm just saying, if this time is para is a parallel, we need to redirect it so that it's being used by God. What's important is 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 what's in our heart. What why why we what is our motives? If we're withholding tithe and not redirecting it, that's different. But you know that that's my view. There are other people are going to agree with me on that or not. Uh, I like <clears throat> I like to say it this way about tithe. Rather than paying my tithe, I'm returning my tithe. Yeah, I like returning rather than paying. The idea is seems all different. Than, I'm not paying a bill. I'm returning what God has given. Yeah, because God has blessed us in many different ways, and so we, you know, so we we put those towards the Lord's work in spreading the gospel. You know, it's supposed to be. You know, there's all these arguments that needs to be in support of ministry, um, uh, which is true, because you have these the Levites who are working. Now, Adventism did set up a system which we call sy- systematic benevolence, which is really actually different than the biblical system. Because in the biblical system, you paid tithe on 10% of your increase, and and your increase is is the increase of your estate, right? wouldn't be because they didn't have income, right? You wouldn't pay tithe on your income because you didn't get paid a wage necessarily, right? So many people had no wages. So and it wasn't, you know, what you sold, it would be your increase, your profit, you know, after all of your expenses, however they would do it. The people would pay a tenth of, 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 of their increase. However, that's determined. We don't know all the details of that, but, what was happening in Adventism is that people were giving every year one tenth of their estate and people were becoming impoverished through the way that they were tithing. And so we set up a system of systematic benevolence where it was based upon tithing a 10% of your income, which is a little bit different than the biblical way of doing it. But in our society today, that, that works pretty well. Of course, how do you, how you determine your income is, 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 you know, up to the up to the person who is determining their income, right? So a person could say they have no income at all, and yet, you know, you're still alive. You know, you've still been feeding yourself all year. So um, I always found it a little bit tro- problematic, like for farmers, how they figure out their income. Obviously, they don't tithe on their gross income uh, because they're not making much. They would have to tithe more than they make sometimes. But anyway, so this is something I believe that is left up to the individual to work out the details, right? And that that it's never meant to to the individual, right? God's system of tithe. Amen. Tithe tithe, tithe is an act of worship between a person and God. Right. That's really what it comes down to. And it's not to be dictated by the church, Right. Now, another way that we look at it is it's a tenth, but it's also a symbol of the remnant. Uh, people understand what I'm referring to. I would agree. Okay, so... Tithe the, representing the remnant? Yeah. Tithe representing the remnant? Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so that's where... Uh, you, and, have the, you have the story of the Levites when they, when they um, got took in the Levites instead of the firstborn. Okay, explain that. I said, I said the Levites, when God took the Levites for the firstborn, that was a tent, wasn't it? No. No, the, Le- the Levites would have been, have been set aside. Yes, I agree with that. And I think your point is that the firstborn of all of the other tribes would have been greater than just the the Levites in number. Yeah, we well we have that in in Numbers chapter three, where we're dealing with the redemption of of the first of the Levites for the replacing the firstborn. Yeah, my other e sword's not working, so I have to go here. 
But yeah, we, we've looked this up before. So when we deal with a tent, now we first see it in Genesis 28, 2. This is going to be Jacob when he sets up his stone for a pillar. Of all that thou shalt give me, will I surely give the tenth unto thee? And and it's interesting that the word is double, surely give a tenth, right? Because that's why it says surely. So six six two three seven. And I'm gonna have to look up this other word. Yeah, I'm gonna have to find it. It's gonna take too long to be for this right now. But there's a connection between the remnant and the tenth and how this works. So I think I just found it, Theodore. If you okay, look at yeah, Isaiah six. Isaiah six verse six thirteen, for example. Six or six eleven to thirteen. Yeah. So this is Isaiah's commission from God in six eleven. It says, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, uh, and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Yeah, that's the verse I was thinking of. So you can see uh, the tenth and uh, shall return, right? So that's shuv. Is the return the tenth is here? Uh, Ashari, right? As Aswar or Asar is a tenth, but here it's just saying that. So we know that often a remnant shall return, but here they say a tenth shall return, right? So we can see the parallel between the idea of the remnant and a tenth. So thanks for that, Angela. Okay. So if we look at at the situation that that we are at in the present time. So we're in a time in which we believe that the ark has been taken captive, that the glory has departed. And we're, we're in a sense in this period in the time of the judges uh, before Christ is going to be made king. They'll say that way. So there's just a parallel here that we can see with our time and our relationship to the church. Right. So we still believe it's God's church. Right. But we recognize that uh, things have gone awry. What uh, what what's the parallel with the ark that you're making with the church here? Well, we're dealing with the arcs being taken captive by the Philistines. And we're saying that this has to do the understanding of the truths of Adventism, uh, Adventism, the foundation of Adventism, the two charts, right? So we look at the Ark has the, the law, right? The two tablets. The tables, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have the two tables, right? So they have okay. been taken. Philistines represent uh, the Protestant interpretation of Scripture, right? So that that what has happened is we have. The foundation of Adventism has been taken away from Adventism. Adventists don't know their history. They don't understand the truths. They they can read they can read the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and not see what's there. The messages on the two tables, the yeah. two charts, have been taken away by uh, apostate Protestantism's influence. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And from yep. there, it goes back to the papacy and paganism. Well, yes, but but as far as the the main application that we look at, and we've been studying that on Friday nights with M. L. Andreasen, right? So looking at what happened with the evangelicals, and that's going to happen in in the third generation, right? From the Doctrine of Christ, published in 1919 by W.W. Uh, w. Prescott, and then in 1957, Seventh-day Adventists answered questions on doctrine, their response to the evangelicals. And that begins the fourth generation in 1957. And the fourth generation, it's in the fourth generation that the time of the end occurs in, in every reform line. So you have the fourth generation arrive, and then in the fourth generation, we have a new reform line. So this is a major reform line. 
beginning in 1989. And, and during that, that, uh, that fourth generation, they have an opportunity, right? But they're going to set aside that opportunity. They're going to set aside what God has given, and it's given to someone else. Now, for many people um, who are, you know, opposed to the church, let's say, let's look at it that way. They see the problems in the church, and but the way in which they go about it isn't always correct, right? That is, you know, they form their own little institutions or their, their groups. They've got all their different ministries, um, you know, parallel churches. They're trying to do, they're trying to replace the church. And, and, and that's, of course, is part of that is just because of what's happened with the church. But they're still not doing anything to bring the ark back. So we're, we're going to look at that story and we've looked at it a little bit. But we're going to see how that parallels this movement, right? So, so there's going to be a lot of detail there. But right now, you know, we're just going to leave it at that because we haven't had the ark being brought back, and that that has to happen. I so, like that point. I like that point about um, the other ministries that that see the problems in the church, and and, and they're there. But they're not doing anything to bring the ark back. They're not doing anything to bring the message, not only the message of of historic, well, our foundations, but not only the message, but to live it. Like, mm-hmm. like yeah, living witnesses. Yeah, I mean, to apply that's... themselves. They're pointing. They're pointing the finger all the while. They've got problems too, right? And and so we see that there's the, these problems um, in the church, and then we have all of these different ministries. And I'm not saying that they, that they're wrong. I'm just saying that there's something else that has to happen, right? The ark has to be brought back, and so that means uh, the ministries are doing a work that that has to be done because of the lack of the work in the church. So I'm not condemning all of these ministries. I'm just saying that it's not it's not going to solve the problem. God has to bring the ark back, and and how that happens and the symbolism attached to that, it, I think, is really important. So uh, the irreverence on the part of the priest soon robbed the service of its holy and solemn significance, and the people abhorred the offering of the Lord, the great anti-typical sacrifice to which they were to look forward, was no longer recognized. Wherefore the sin of the young men is very great before the Lord. So when we look at this anti-typical sacrifice, we can see that this is pointing to type and anti-type, understanding prophecy. These unfaithful priests also transgressed God's law and dishonored their sacred office by their vile and degrading practices, yet they continued to pollute by their presence the tabernacle of God. Many of the people filled with indignation at the corrupt course of Hophni and Phinehas ceased to come up to the appointed place of worship. Thus, the service which God had ordained was despised and neglected because associated with the sins of wicked men, while those whose hearts were inclined to evil were emboldened in sin. Ungodliness, profligacy, profligacy, however you say that, and even idolatry prevailed uh, to a fearful extent. So we see part of what has also happened, if you want to look at it, is all of these different winds of doctrine are also the result of the failure of the church to do its 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 job. And the church likes to blame these winds of doctrine as the problem without recognizing their own problem, that they have actually caused this. And they cause it and how they deal with people who are in error. Yeah, so Angela says, placing the unfaithful with the faithful diligent in 1 Samuel 2.35, um, which we haven't got to. The 2.35 has something to do with Jewish timekeeping. That's the number of months in a, in a metonic cycle. So just, just reminding Angela what, what that 2.35 is. 19 years, right? 235 months. Okay, Eli had greatly erred in permitting his sons to minister in holy office by excusing their course on one pretext and another he became blinded to their sins but at last they reached a pass 
where he could no longer hide his eyes from the crimes of his sons. The people complained of their violent deeds, and the high priest was grieved and distressed. He dared remain silent no longer, but his sons had been brought up to think of no one but themselves, and now they cared for no one else. They saw the grief of their father, but their hard hearts were not touched. They heard his mild admonitions, but they were not impressed, nor could they change their evil course, though warned of the consequences of their sins. Had Eli dealt justly with his wicked sons, they would have been they would have been rejected from the priestly office and punished with death. Dreading thus to bring public disgrace and condemnation upon them, he sustained them in the most sacred positions of trust. He still permitted them to mingle their corruption with the holy service of God and to inflict upon the cause of truth an injury which years could not efface. But when the judge of Israel neglected his work, God took the matter in hand. So this is going to move to another section in Patriarchs and Prophets, back to the chapter about them getting a king. Uh, Saul was a son of powerful and well, of, of a powerful and wealthy chief. Yet in accordance with the simplicity of the times, he was engaged with his father in the humble duties of a husbandman. Some of his father's animals had strayed upon the mountains, and Saul went with a servant to seek for them. For three days they searched in vain, when, as they were not far from Ramah, the house of Samuel, the servant proposed that they should inquire of the prophet concerning the missing property. I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver, he said. What will I give to the man of God to tell that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. This was in accordance with the custom of the times. A person approaching a superior in rank or office made him a small present as an expression of respect. As they drew near to the city, they met some young maidens who had come out to draw water and inquired of them for the seer. In reply, they were told that a religious service was about to take place, that the prophet had already arrived. It was to be an offering upon the high place and after that, a sacrificial feast. A great change had taken place under Samuel's administration. When the call of God first came to him, the services of the sanctuary were held in contempt. Right. So this is that part that we had read earlier, in the first, first paragraph of this section. So, so we can see that this point is brought to our attention again here. Um, God had not approved or to or God will not approve or bless the authorities at Battle Creek in turning things upside down. So this is a completely different uh, section. It's not from Patriarchs and Prophets, from letter 65, 1895, but she's going to quote from 1 Samuel 2, uh, verse 12 to 17, dealing with, or she's going to refer us to Eli's sons, the sons of Belial. God will not approve or bless the authorities at Battle Creek in turning things upside down, departing from the faith once delivered to the saints. Uh, she says, read Malachi 3.3. 3. The whole chapter should be studied. Please read also 1 Samuel 2, verse 12 to 17. If the extortion practiced by the sons of Eli was a sin before God, how does the sin of selfish men who have accepted $30 a week for their labor stand in the sight of a holy God? Where is seen the practice of the self-denial and self-sacrifice of Christ? What example has been given at the very heart of the work at Battle Creek? Is it an example of devotion and self-sacrifice that may be safely followed by other institutions just as worthy? So I don't know the whole context there. God has tested men, tested their devotion, their principles. Those who have eagerly grasped all they could get have revealed the true state of their hearts. Some have been very zealous that others who engage in the work just as earnestly as themselves shall have scarcely a chance to work in freedom with their God-given ability. All must come under the management of parties who have evidenced their willingness to have all they can possibly grasp to advantage themselves. The Lord sees all this. Does he serve with such a spirit? No, verily no. I tell you, my brethren, blindness in part has happened. Unto Israel, I have chapters concerning this wrong management, but I forbear. So um, here we just have some statements in spirit of prophecy about mismanagement of and, and selfishness on the part of leadership, expecting other people not, not to have that same freedom they have uh, to do things that God wants them to do. We all know the saying, a workman is worthy of his hire. 
it, it's a difficult thing. Money can really change people, right? Disputes over money. <clears throat> it's and people get get it wrong. It's money isn't the root of all evil. It's the love of money that changes people. Yeah. But also people not being treated properly, not being uh, provided for properly, um, you know, in in the movement, you know, at the School of the Prophets, you know, the workers who worked there really didn't get paid sufficiently, which was part of the yeah. problem in 2016. You know, they did all this work and then they didn't get anything for it. And and people have to live, right? So people should be compensated fairly. If people choose themselves to to sacrifice what God has blessed them with, that's fine, right? But for them to be withheld um, their due, their what what's what they deserve, uh, and, yeah. and and money to be squandered in other ways. So if you look at two, I'm just dealing with the School of Prophets in 2016. So they they built all of these buildings. You know, lots and lots and lots of money, but they were skimping on paying their workers, right? So imagine if you're a worker doing all of this work and you see hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent and, and you're barely getting enough to live on. You know, you're, 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 you're basically working as a slave, right? You're just a, a pittance, right? Um, you're not going to ever be able to do the things that you need to do. Some of them were, were health things for some of the people. They had health expenses that wouldn't uh, be provided for. You know, they didn't have any any health care plan. And, uh, you know, it. I know some of the details. I'm not going to go into them. But can you see that that's really unfair? That you yes. Have some... And James, yeah, and the book of James talks about that and uh, act. Six talks about that, and other passages talk about it. I mean, I would be furious. I would be absolutely furious. Like, I don't mind volunteering, but if somebody promises to pay me and doesn't, do you think I'm going to work for that person again or tell some, hey, that's a really good boss to have? No way. And I would tell them to their face. Yeah. And especially when you're being In this case, I don't think it, in, in that, in the case of School of the Prophets, I don't think it was promised. It was just expected. And there's probably a sense of uh, guilt and shame, religious, uh, what is it called, abuse, in a sense? Yeah. I mean, I know more about the situation. I'm not going to go into details. So so some of the problems that happened at the School of the Province were really just about mistreatment, not about, you know, doctrines or beliefs that people ended up leaving. Basically, just being taken advantage of. And it can be pretty evident when somebody's being taken advantage of, when you when you know you're being taken advantage of. And, and I saw it, so you know it's 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 just God wants us to deal fairly with people, and people the, should, lab, the labor the labor is worthy of his hire. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so unfortunate because. Like the school of prophets was just an amazing, amazing thing that God did, and to see it, to see it ruined by, I don't know, mismanagement or management and selfishness and and emotions, right? You know, so one is I know quite a bit about self-supporting work, what we call self-supporting work, and. They did not follow the councils in the spirit of prophecy regarding how things were to be done. They kept claiming they were, and that the only people reason why people were having problems is they were rebelling against God's counsel. But it wasn't God's counsel at all. You know, it was just mismanaged, and they put the blame on others, which is not a good thing. So now we dealt with this a little bit um, with this ephod. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So we understand that this, this little coat or this is, is the ephod, I believe, right? That's how I've understood it, or maybe it's part of it, but. 
And then we have the part, Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went in, unto their own place. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Okay, so, so we have these these sections, 18 and 19 and 20 and 21. So we're saying that this is going to represent uh, 2018 and 2019, and then 20 and 21. So we're going to, um, and if I'm going to attach dates to these, I would say October 13th, 2018, November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021, right? So as far as the, the main dates there. So we, we dealt with that yesterday. Any thoughts on this? Okay, so this is from Christian Education uh, 217, okay, paragraph one. Uh, it was not customary for the Levites to enter upon their peculiar services until they were 25 years of age, but Samuel had been an exception to this rule. Every year saw more important trusts committed to him. And while he was yet a child, a linen ephod was placed upon him as a token of his consecration to the work of the sanctuary. Young as he was, when brought to minister in the tabernacles, tabernacle, Samuel had even then duties to perform in the service of God according to his capacity. These were at first very humble and not always pleasant, but they were performed at the best of his ability with a willing heart. His religion was carried into every duty of life. He regarded himself as God's servant and his work as God's work. Okay. So we have, we've read that statement before, um, at least something similar to that in the spirit of prophecy. That, state, that statement that his religion was carried into every, every duty of life, that really stands out up to me. And also I was thinking when I, I don't know, I didn't hear her say this, but I was, I was told S had said that working at that FFA was like working on a plantation. From what you're saying now, that was giving the enemy a chance to speak reproachfully because God's people did not carry out what they should have done. Yeah, so, um, so thanks. Um, so signs of the times, February 18th, 1897. God has honored the young. He chose Joseph in his youth to do a special work for his people. He called Samuel and committed to him a solemn message by a solemn vow. Before his birth, Hannah had given Samuel to the Lord. After his birth, true to her vow, she took him to the tabernacle. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year, year to year. And when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice, how many prayers the mother stitched into this token of love for her child. Of Samuel, it was said, as of the John the Baptist in Christ, that the child Samuel grew on and was in favor with both the Lord and also with men. So still not clear to me whether this ephod that he wears is made by his mother or not. And, and it's not clear, obviously, here in the translation in the King James. Um, we got. Uh, Don't we equate the coat as a righteousness or unrighteousness? Mm -hmm. yeah, so the righteousness of Christ. Just going to look at some Hebrew here. Mm -hmm. um, what does the spirit of prophecy say something about the coat uh, being every stitch was with a prayer or something or with love. So yeah. I, I could see that, that applying to like righteousness, a robe of righteousness. Yeah. How many prayers the mother stitched into this token of love for her child? Yeah. And that's, that's Christ praying for us, you know, as mm. he stitches righteousness into our lives. Yeah. Oh man. Now, I mean, with this ephod and this coat that's being stitched, so we can see that we have two things. There is Christ's character that's being developed in his people, right? But we also have, you know, so we're saying that Samuel primarily represents a message. And it's a message of with this linen ephod. And it also has this coat attached to it that has Christ's righteousness. So I think they're... I think they're two different garments that are being referred to. 
not one garment. And any thoughts on that? I, I can't find anything that says that they're the same garment. This yes. Is so I, I think there are two. One's a coat and one's an ephod. Yeah. So this ephod. We've got a, we've got a question on that, uh, yeah. on the ephod. Uh, what was it? What was, oh, what was the breastplate that the high priest wore, was it, with the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes? Yeah. Yeah, the breastplate. What was it called? Oh, it was called the breastplate? Yeah. In the sanctuary? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm getting it mixed up with uh, Ephod. I thought it was called that. but And then the Urim and Thummim. Left and right, yeah, on the shoulders. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure. I've seen different representations in how people look at the garments of the high priest, how they draw it. Or... Hi, Stephen. So here we have this, um, these two different garments. So we have the linen ephod that Samuel has, and then his mother giving him a coat. So, uh, what can the ephod represent? I mean, obviously, it has to do with ministering as a priest, but more that we can ephod. Okay, well, let's do a quick little study on the ephod. So we're going to get ephod in Exodus 25, verse 7, where it talks about um, uh, that there's going to be onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So the ephod and the breastplate both have stones in, in them. Exodus 28, 4, and these are the, are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a miter and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, my brother and his sons, that they may minister unto the priest's office. So, you know, obviously things sometimes in translation. Uh, so... Uh, the breastplate is koshen, which comes from a meaning uh, to sparkle, to contain or sparkle. Perhaps a pocket is holding the urim and thummim, or rich as containing gems, right? So they're not really sure sometimes how to translate these things. The ephod we already looked at was the Hebrew number 646, which is the number of years from July 27th in 1299 or from the 26th day of the fourth month in 1299 to the 26th day of the fourth month in um which is the 26th day of the fourth month is um august 6 1945 the bombing of hiroshima right and that's going to be 646 years on the islamic calendar it's 666 years so so we're just saying it has to do with that message uh, then a robe uh, mahil in the sense of a covering that is the upper and outer garment our cloak and then a broidered coat well we know what broidered is now here it says reticulated or checkered uh, stuff um, and then a coat of course is kethaneth which is just like a shirt or a garment and of course, a miter, we know what that is. That's like a turban. And then a girdle, that's a belt. Right. So, so sometimes these words are translated differently. But here we can say that he has an ephod and a coat. Right. So an ephod being um, like a shoulder piece. Okay. Like the yoke of Christ. Yeah, in a sense. But, um, yeah, so it's a shoulder piece. So exactly what that is, I don't know. Maybe it's like more like a shawl or something that goes over the shoulders. You know, not really sure. But then he also has a coat. So so what would these represent? Well, wouldn't that ephod represent the, um, the voice of God talking to him about choosing certain things? No. You're you're thinking of the breastplate and the urim and thummim. This is no no stones or anything. This is just a linen ephod, some kind of shoulder piece, something that goes over the shoulders. Well, didn't it have two um, 
two um, stones in it. No, no. One. You're thinking of no. This does not have stones in it. Just this. This is a plain white linen ephod. It's not the high priest's garment. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right. So don't get mixed up with this with the breastplate and and the the urim and thummim. Those are stones. There's no stones here. Okay, so Angela has Isaiah 9, verse 6. I know what that's going to say. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So the dealing with his shoulder, that has to do with the placings of burdens upon the shoulder, right? So maybe the ephod in some ways symbolizes the taking on of these burdens. How, how do we think of that idea? That it's 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 an ephod in a sense of responsibility. Yes, I, I can accept that. It's like parenting. It's like priesthood. Yeah. So, you know, what, so in what are, those, what, are, what are those words, linen, linen and ephod say in, in the Hebrew? So what do you mean? What do they sound like? What you're you're concerned about the pronunciation of the word linen and ephod? No, no. the The meaning behind it is there any well, subtle ephod, meanings? To linen. Ephod, yeah, ephod just refers to like a like a girdle that's placed upon the shoulder, right? So it, linen. some kind of shoulder piece that 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 covers the shoulder that's used to girt. So that's why I was saying it's maybe like a shawl or something that's put over the shoulders. It could be tied up the waist. So it's it's yeah, what not the word. What about the word linen? Okay. Well, Hebrew nine oh six uh, is bad. That's and it just means divided fibers, flax and thread or yarn, right? Okay. So yeah, just um, um, interesting. It means divided. Comes from nine zero nine, possibly badad, which means uh, alone. But whether that's correct or not, they just say possibly. It comes from that to be separated. And, and then I want, then I wanted to look at uh, also a little coat. What does little mean there? The meaning so a little coat. Um, six just nine. Like what a Tan. Uh, this just means diminutive can be least small, so it's just small. Um, and then a coat, uh, ma'il, in the sense of a covering, a robe, cloak. So it's just something to cover a person. It comes from 4609, which means what comes up, thoughts, that doesn't make sense. So something over something, I guess, is what it is. Hmm. Okay. So we have these these two symbols, right? This linen ephod, this little coat. It's kind of interesting. Okay. So um, so we got these two words. So if we take the linen ephod, just uh, here, just hang on. Okay. So we got uh, with the linen being there was something double or something. You said what was it? Yeah, means to divide. Oh, to divide. Okay, I was thinking <clears throat> with linen being stitched together, humanity and divinity combined. But, uh, no, this is more divided, like in the sense of being alone or separate. So the idea probably has to do with um, uh, just the the way that, the, like, that's why I say it's more like like the shawl or something like that. It's, it's it divides front and back, like. Uh, and then it could be tied about about the waist, rather than like a coat with arms or sleeves. So it's something that goes on the shoulders, the linen ephod. So, so the idea of linen means divided, right? And then you have ephod, which is this covering. So, uh, I mean, we could look at it in different ways, I guess. But so that's what we have: a linen ephod. So it's the material it's made out of, but it does mean to divide. Maybe comes from the process see of. See, there are a lot of sixes and nines here. H696 or 6996 and then H906. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah. Now, uh, so let me see here. So we had uh, 906 plus 646 uh, together is 1552, which if you divide that is 776, because, you know, 1554 is 777 uh, divided by 2 or times 2. 777 times 2 is 1554. So being one less than 777 is kind of interesting, but um, whether that's significant there or not, I don't know. Any any other thoughts on this? Well, H776, uh, Eretz, I guess, from an unused not pro root, probably meaning to be firm. And it says the Earth at large are part of the a land, common country, Earth being You're looking at new number 776, you're saying? That's what it says in my Strong's. I know that some, there are some yeah. variations in others. I got the yeah. 2015 version. Well, I yeah, think. 776. <laughs> it's, it's falling apart. It's the, it's the word Eretz, <laughs> Earth, right? Yeah, so, but it could be firm also. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can mean, it, it has lots of different meanings. <laughs> Because it can refer to the earth, the whole earth. It That's Hebrew earth. for you. It's like English. Yeah. Well, they don't have very many words in Hebrew. You know, in the, in the Oxford English Dictionary, there's 500,000 English words. Uh, as you can see in the Hebrew Dictionary, uh, we got, you know, 8,674 words. So, and a lot of them are just uh, like names, which are variations of things. So there's really about 5,000 actual words in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, if you break it down. So, so we're saying that if we go to 2018 and 2019, that's where we're going to have to start looking at uh, tomorrow, dealing more in detail with this part of the line. We'll look more at it on Sunday, not tomorrow. Yeah, Sunday. Yeah, yeah, Sunday. Thanks. Yeah, tomorrow, no. We'll be here. Now, um, so Kelly has a thing dealing with, uh, okay, just talking about this. Maybe we'll look at that, about the EFOD. Where is this from, Kelly? Uh, Wikipedia. I'll post a link here. Okay. So it's just on Wikipedia on an EFOD? Okay, we can look at that on Sunday. Yeah. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Uh, just for 776. In Ezekiel's temple, you have the yeah. entrance of the most holy place with a, a door, I think the door is six cubits. And then beside it, walls or whatever it is, is uh, seven cubits. You have also with Jacob, Seven years, seven years, and then six years before he leaves Lehman. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, just uh, throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. And I think we kind of looked at some of these before with the 776. Yeah. But it's one short of 777, which is still significant. But exactly what that means in the context here, I don't know. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. Okay, well, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time here this morning. We just pray for a blessing upon this recording for those that watch it later, and that you can be with them and be with us throughout this day. Guide and direct us in all that we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.